everyone. Welcome to the Steve Maxwell Drums Podcast. Don't forget to check us out on our website at www.maxwelldrums.com and then our reverb stores at Steve Maxwell Drums-Chicago and Steve Maxwell Drums-New York. We also have social media, uh, two Instagram accounts, at Maxwell Drum Shop Chicagoland and then at Maxwell Drum Shop. And then also on Facebook, Steve Maxwell and Steve Maxwell Drum Shop. And then, of course, check us out on Twitter, at Maxwell Drum Shop. We will interview players, collectors, drum and cymbal builders, and also teachers about all things percussion. And you can go to YouTube if you want to see the video. We'll have pictures of drum shops, of drum sets, badges, cymbals, all kinds of fun stuff. So let's get started. We hope you enjoy it. All right, three, two, one. So I'm here with Tim Wilsey, good old friend of the shops, good old friend of mine. And uh, Tim has been a local musician. Um, we'll talk about kind of how he got into music, all that kind of stuff. He does a lot of stuff with uh, big groups, um, kind of ed- educator as well. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. Has, a, has a good long history with the shop. So, so yeah, say hi, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Good Pretty to see good. You. Yeah, Thanks likewise. How you, how you doing, man? Doing good. Doing good. Beautiful day outside. Great to be here and great to see <laughs> all the vintage gear here. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Great to have you, man. Thanks. Thanks. So, um, yeah, let's talk about uh, where are you from originally? So, born originally in Berkshire County, uh, Massachusetts, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which was west part of the state, hmm. eh, about an hour, 45 minutes west of Boston. Cool. That's yeah. close to, you know, Rhode Island, where my my family hails from. <laughs> oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My parents are both from Rhode Island. I... I grew up here, but they're, uh, me and my brother grew up here, but they're from uh, Rhode Island originally. Since you say that now, I remember them telling me, yeah, <laughs> yeah they got some great beaches down in Rhode Island. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. They have big mansions over the Newport. <laughs> uh-huh. It's beautiful, the East Coast. Oh, but, it is. It so, is. Uh, and then, uh, did you did you do the whole college thing? Yeah, so I went to school at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Um, and then what about even, even with high school? Like, could you yeah. tell me a little bit about... Maybe, yeah, just like what first got you into music, if you had like a really inspirational family member or teacher. Or... Dad. Dad was a drummer. Dad was a jazz drummer. Originally, parents were originally from Maywood, so the Chicago area. Oh, okay. Um, Dad got a job out in the East Coast and started living, the, you know, lived out in Western Massachusetts. I was the only one from the family born. My, whole, my sisters are all from the Chicago area. So they picked up and moved. Uh, moved out to the East Coast. I was born out there, and before I could even walk, I was on my dad's lap playing the drums and behind <laughs> cool. a slingerland set, and got going on big band music right away. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, from there, uh, yeah, I went to school all in Massachusetts. Did you have a good like high school music experience? Uh, actually, no. I had oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Catholic school all my life. Didn't have music programs. It was all academics oh, and sports related. So what I did was uh, played the local scene and studied privately. I actually would, used to study with a guy named Randy Kay who was from Brooklyn, New York. Hmm. And so I got started with him at the Berkshire Music School and studied with Randy uh, probably around eighth grade, freshman year of high school. So was your dad like a gigging musician? Yeah, he did. He was gigging in Chicago. By the time he moved out to Massachusetts, he uh, had stopped, you know, stopped working as a musician. But eventually, he found his way back in the music industry. He was uh, VP of Sales and Marketing for a company which became the largest cassette manufacturer for a long time. Oh, cool, man! I want to do a podcast about cassette tapes at some point. I talked about that in one of the one of the earlier ones. That's cool. So. So they manu- do you know do you remember the name? The, the yeah, company? Polymatrix was the name of the company. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen one of those before. So yeah. many different types of cassettes, yeah. and grades and everything. Yeah. He and he was instrumental. He actually created some uh, some things for the company. He'd made the uh, I don't know if you remember the the world of cassettes going back. There used to be the double cassettes cases where you would open like a, a, a hmm. band or an artist would put out a double album on cassette. I think I've seen a couple of those. It's been a long time, but I think I have seen. I think I remember maybe at some, uh, you know, just uh, remember, remember when there were stores that sold, you know, music. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Long time ago, record stores. Yeah, record stores. You have your, your double CDs, and I think I do remember a couple double cassettes. Yeah, but he was created that his, that. his idea. Oh, yeah, cool. He created that, and then I remember one day I'm, we're sitting there at the dining room table, and he comes in and he throws down this round silver disc, and I said, "What the heck is that?" And he <laughs> said, "That's what music's going to be." 
That's the, the future. Next years. That's the future, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that he left the company and started his own company uh, and uh, got into compact discs. Cool. And manufacturing the basically the boxes for compact discs. Oh, nice. And so he worked a lot out in, he did business in New York, and then he did business out in the West Coast in Los Angeles. He dealt with all the record companies, Warner Brothers and Capitol Records. And yeah, it seems like a good solid, uh, good, solid business to be in. It was. And it so, was at the time, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so your, um, your, your, your. Let's talk about your kind of earlier, yeah, um, experience with music. I imagine your dad was probably like your first teacher. Dad was my first teacher. Same with me. I, yeah, my exactly. Dad was my first teacher. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, growing up in the house, uh, the big thing was to stay up late and watch Johnny. Um, because Buddy was going to be on Buddy Rich, of course, or Louis Belson, or I wanted to see Ed Shaughnessy. So, um, my I learned really early. My we lived in a ranch house, and I had my door in my bedroom. If you cracked it just right enough, you got a perfect view of the TV. So I would be sent to bed, but I would stay up and just crack the door, and I'd be able to see. Okay, Buddy's on tonight, so I could watch That's it. Cool. And then my dad, of course, would yell and say, "Carnac, go to bed." You know <laughs> what I mean? You know, stop staying up. So. <laughs> So uh, listening to records, uh, my dad, you know, watching him, listening to him, being around him, uh, studying with uh, Randy Kay privately by the time I got into eighth grade freshman year, and then working with older musicians. That was, that was the best experience, to be able to go out and play with older musicians, guys that are more experienced and knowledgeable. So what, do you remember the first group that you, you played with, your, wow. your first band? <laughs> um, no, I don't. I remember the great thing that I think helped me with my career was I played in three or four bands at the same time. So I played in a rock band, and we were doing a lot of the hair band stuff, the things from the 80s, a lot of the rock stuff, straight ahead stuff. <laughs> and then I discovered I loved R&B, and I loved soul music, and I loved Prince. Nice. So then I was in a band doing that type of music, and I love that music. Did your dad do rock at all, or was he kind of like strictly a jazz guy? Dad was a jazz guy. Dad was big band. And then uh, by just going through his record collection, listening to him, uh, Buddy and Louie and Gene and all the greats, uh, then I got into Joe Morello, the small group stuff. So you were kind of first into jazz, and then what got you into more uh, modern, you know, Rock 80s and, and 80s and 90s stuff. stuff. <laughs> well, that's the benefit of having two older sisters. I oh, had okay. two older sisters <laughs> they, that had the record player down in the basement that would be playing Zeppelin and Queen and Van Halen <laughs> and all that stuff. And, you know, when you hear when you hear Zeppelin or hear Van Halen's first album, then boom, <laughs> you're, you're mainlined in. Yeah, you're mainlined in. So then I got into sure. rock from that. Now, yeah. Did you have long hair? I did, if you can yeah. believe it. <laughs> For sure. I had beautiful I also, long hair. Yeah. Did you? Okay. Oh yeah, I had. I, had, uh, I even had dread like dreadlocks at one point. No Twice, kidding. actually. <laughs> yeah, right. like right around high school and then in the middle of college. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, I've had many, many a uh, uh, style and uh, <laughs> sure. over over the years. Cool, man. Yeah. So so you were doing the the band thing. Did you guys like? Make good money? Did you did you have a no. a good racket set up, or was it <laughs> just more for the passion of the music? Uh, no, I, I I got into it. Certainly, I think my first playing professionally for money, if you will, was probably teens. But to <laughs> offset costs of not making a lot of money, uh, was to play in multiple bands. Sure. And and what that allowed me to do was not only to play music, different musical styles, learn from different musicians but generate revenue in different ways. But it also meant for me to keep a calendar, which was great. Hmm. Uh, being on time for rehearsals, um, showing up gigs, not double booking, those type of things. That was great. That was a great experience. And I got even into a country band. Yeah. And I was playing with people that were in their 40s and 50s at the time, and I was in my teens. So at this point, you're living, are you back in Chicagoland? Or is no, this I'm still, this is still back in Massachusetts. Okay, Still cool. back in Massachusetts. Still living at mom and dad's house. And mom was a nurse, worked 11 to 7. Dad worked during the day. And, of course, where do the bands always rehearse? They always rehearse at the drummer's house, usually. Sure. So my mom would work 11 to 7, and then she'd come home and try to sleep while I was rehearsing <laughs> during the day. With, Did you, you know, have, like, a basement? We had a basement. We at had, least that 
makes the sound yeah. a little bit, yeah. <laughs> it absorb a little bit into the crowd. Exactly. You try to soundproof <laughs> it as best you can. But sure. I, at that time, Carpet I was playing. And... Yeah. <laughs> we would get, we would get, you know, heavy carpeting and, and we'd go and get, you know, heavy duty blankets and just hang them and layer them and sure. just try to deaden the sound. And that's what we did. But I had a, <laughs> I had a Ludwig um, set with 24s, two twenty four so. Oh yeah, so so yeah. What was your first? Um, what was like your first kit that you got that that you started playing? Because I mean, your dad. What was he? Was he maybe like a Rogers or Slingerland guy? I'm Slingerland guessing? guy. Ah, okay, cool. Slingerland guy. So my first set I got to play and grow up on it was Slingerland set, which I actually still have. Oh really? In storage. That was your, your father's kit. My father's kit. What which, was that one? What were like the sizes? <laughs> uh, I I think a twenty. I don't know if it was 20, a 12, and a 14, or a 20, a 12, and a 16. Right, yeah, it could be either. Um, and That's a nice portable portable oh, setup. Oh, it was a great <laughs> setup. Matter of fact, the plan is, and I still have it in, shor- in storage back in Massachusetts, the plan <laughs> is to ship it here and have maybe possibly you guys restore it or do yeah, whatever man. with it. Yeah, we'd love to. We can take it yeah. apart, you know, give it a nice uh you know scrub down sure <laughs> you could make it all all shine again yeah i want to put you know maybe if it needs new lugs or whatever and new the heads and all that because it's still got the calfskin heads on and oh like cool that. so yeah it's still so i uh, started on that set and then eighth grade graduation was if i did well in school i can pick out whatever set i'm mm-hmm. gonna graduate eighth grade do well in school and we go to the drum store and that's 1987 and what's anybody playing in 1987? The biggest set you can possibly find. The more drums, the bigger the diameter of the drums, everything. <laughs> so, of course, I had to get, uh, you know, double bass, 24s, you know, four rack toms, 16 and 18, just a mammoth kit. Did you go for a Ludwig? It was or, a Ludwig. Yeah, that's why I figured. It was a Ludwig. Seeing as your, yeah. I think, I'm not, I'm actually not a huge expert on 80s, 80s stuff, but... Yeah, I just... Uh, the drums were so huge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the stands back then were, you know, huge in diameter. It what was kind ridiculous. of finish did you go for? It was like a Vistalite? Chrome. Or? Oh, chrome. So chrome over wood. Chrome over wood. Those are cool kits, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I still have a set. Um, it's going to go to my nephew, uh, who's also a drummer. Um, but yeah, so nice. I graduated <laughs> that set. And then when you realize you're playing opening sets in a bar... Sure. And you don't want to spend an hour and a half to set up yeah, yeah. a 10-piece drum set. Then I bought a, uh, a small pearl, you know, black set. So were you kind of the booking guy when you were in all these different bands? Or were you were you just the drummer? Were you kind of finding people who were doing that? Or maybe was it a little bit kind of balanced between everybody? Great question. <clears throat> um, I learned from the people that I was working with. They were all older than me. Usually they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years older than I was. Yeah that I watched them and listened to them how they conducted business. And so eventually, I like to say at a young age, I started getting into the business side of it, booking, going out, seeking, whether it's a promoter, just a bartender, whoever you're talking to, whether it's just a bar or a lodge or whatever the booking is, I wanted to start doing that myself too because I figured, you know, the more I do that, you know, the more opportunity hopefully I'll have. So Yeah, that's a that's a cool thing about this podcast. Anyone who's listening who's who's maybe younger that that is interested in trying to pursue some sort of musical career. Yeah, you always have to have yeah. the business side. And I've I've interviewed a lot of different people and I I sometimes go into that like, you know, how how did you use your creativity to, you know, set stuff up and make things happen? Cause yeah. There are plenty of people out there who are great players but just don't really do all that much because they have never looked into that side of of the, you know. <laughs> totally. Because, yeah, if you, you can write a million tunes that are really, really just killer. Yeah. And then never anyone have anyone hear them, <laughs> which is kind of sad, actually. you got to have at least one guy in the band who's, like, you know, busting his butt, uh, you know, going out there and meeting people and networking. And yeah, it's, it's always been different. My dad, he talked about... Uh, Shops and then the unions. Okay. You know. Did did you did you join the union at all when you were out in uh, in Massachusetts? No, it wasn't as prominent, or at least right. in the circles that I was this in. This is a little. This is kind of when 
a little later when it, would, it definitely wasn't as, as prominent, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It wasn't as prominent at the time when I was playing, but um, I would have done whatever I needed to do, you know, definitely sure. to work. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, any type of success that I've ever had in business uh, from a performance standpoint as a musician has always been essentially going out and the business. Right, right. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember the names of any of the bands that you were in? Yeah, I was in a rock band called uh, Big Pain. Big pain. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> uh, I was in a, another band called uh, Tree of Life, which was we were doing the the the, uh, uh, the Prince stuff and uh, Living Color and a lot of that cool, stuff, man. which is great. Um, yeah, Pr- Prince tunes are so cool. They they're always they'll have some kind of weird like there's like one measure missing. You know yeah. what I mean? Or they'll add one measure. Like, sure. Like the forms are, are really creative. That's one thing I really great like writer. About Prince's, great Prince's writer. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then the country band I was in a band called Second Wind, which was all you know all country, and I learned from everything from Hank Williams Sr. all the way to at the time we were playing Alan Jackson stuff. So yes. that was that was fantastic. I love playing country music. Awesome. Yeah. And then so um, eventually, I, I guess this is this is kind of covering your high school years at this high point. School, Maybe a little after. High school, a little bit after, a little during college, a little after college. So what what made you decide to do college? Uh, hockey. I was also a hockey player. Oh, really? So, so growing up in you Massachusetts, played hockey in college. Played hockey. Cool. Man. I never well knew that too. about you. Yeah, yeah. Hockey was huge. <laughs> um, so I played hockey too, and then. Um, but did you? Was your major music? No, just general studies. It was you know business that type of oh, thing. I never I never studied outside of <laughs> music when I was studying with uh, with uh, the drum instructor Randy K. Um, I never studied you know formally in, in school i considered berkeley uh my parents took sure. me to berkeley i sat in the lobby we took the tour i looked around you <laughs> sit in the lobby and it's the most intimidating place you've ever been in your life you know yeah. you look at every great artist you can ever imagine in the world of music particularly jazz and fusion you know went to berkeley at some capacity so i was i wasn't sure and uh so i just decided you know not to go my parents aren't going to spend the money if i wasn't you know 100 percent sure yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. I mean, that's yeah. I've I've heard mixed things about Berkeley in that era, though. I've heard mostly good things. Yeah, oh, some, the greats coming out of there. Yeah, right. And yeah, sometimes I've heard like the, sometimes the there's too many guitars. Too, you know, like they, yeah. they have issues with that. But too many drummers, maybe. But that happens, I think, at every school. At the school I went to, there was like never any bass players. The first two years, freshman and sophomore, there was like one bass player, like six drummers. They, they, came each year one bass player for 12 i'm not even exaggerating looks like those guys were working a lot then <laughs> well i mean yeah and then the older guys had to come and play a little bit and uh-huh it, it, it might have not quite been that bad but yeah and then yeah there, there were some guys who were a little more experienced than others there, there was one bass player that that everyone kind of wanted to play with but yeah I, my i know that my year that i started there there was just yeah, there was one guy. And then the next year it might have been two, two that came in, but just one guy and I think there were at least five drummers. And then there were other classical guys. This is uh-huh. just on the jazz side of things, but Sure, sure. But yeah, <laughs> that's good. that's a difficulty at just about every college, I think, or every school, you know, you're a high school teacher trying to put together Hey, maybe you should try. Uh, you ever thought about trying tuba? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know the instruments that, <laughs> which is actually a really cool instrument. But it's a fantastic instrument. Yeah, I a little, love the tuba. A little heavy to move around, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But very much in demand. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you can get tuba. I, I sure. Bet you can get tuba gigs easier than getting drum gigs. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I, I know a bass player who does uh, tuba stuff as well as bass stuff. He, he knows Do both you? of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Believe it or not. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. But yeah, so um, so when did you end up moving out to Chicago to, area. to the Chicago area? Yeah, uh, ninety five, December ninety five. Okay. Picked up, packed everything in the car, drove. <laughs> I came out with my father for a family reunion about a year or two before, and spent some time in the area. I'd always have been coming back and forth because we had relatives out here. Right. So we came out, we did a family reunion, fell in love with the area, and I, and I wanted to make a go of it, you know, from a career standpoint. And it was sure. really, at that time, was considering three major places. It was going to be New York, it was going to be L.A., it was going to be Chicago. Being the fact that I had family out here, I said, let's give it a go in Chicago. And uh, So this is like a little bit after college? Yeah. 
And where was the college you went to? Was it in Amherst, okay. Massachusetts? All right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then, so that was the reason you just wanted to go to a big city, and you kind of felt some connections in the city because of your families. Yeah, I had cousins background. and aunts and uncles out here that I could, you know, you could rely upon or to spend time with and come into a larger area. Yeah. So I came out here in '95, and and I was starting to go out in auditions probably within a week. You know, I brought my symbols with. Are you still playing that huge Ludwig kit at this no. point? No, <laughs> it's, it's in storage. It goes, it's going to go to my nephew. Um, yeah, thankfully, I don't have to lug that around in gigs anymore. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, at this point in 95 when you moved out Oh, here. no. I just brought my cymbals with. I know you don't play it anymore. Yeah. I've seen you play a bunch of times. Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Hey, you would be a little excessive in some of those gigs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, came out here, uh, brought the cymbals, bought a set out here. Um, and then uh, started going to auditions and started to gig pretty quickly, you know, uh, probably within a couple weeks. Um, and were you, at this point, were you doing, getting back into jazz a little bit, or were you, were you still doing mostly, uh, you know, rock and roll stuff? Uh, at the time, from a gig standpoint, I was doing um, the, the, kind of the alternative scene was really big. Uh, Jim Blossom's uh, Smashing Pumpkins were big here locally. And like yeah, grunge stuff. Grunge stuff. So I was doing the Metro gigs and playing um, clubs downtown, but you were playing on bills with three or four or five bands on the night, and you're playing for the door, and that means you're not making anything. Sure. And did, you have, did you have like a flannel... <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't do the flannel thing. Not yet at that time yet. No. Um, and torn, torn jeans and... I had cut my hair, though. Four-piece kit. <laughs> yeah. Because that's, that's the funny thing about grunge. Yeah, that's when kind of the kits got much smaller. Kits got smaller. Which is I, it, better for us drummers, I think. It makes our job a little easier. Yeah, it did. Especially if you're going on, you're only playing 20, 30-minute sets. You know, so sure. it, it made sense. But I, I did cut my hair. So I was... I had the time. I still had hair. It was a little bit past the ear, which was the appropriate... Sure. length for you know for the grunge scene um <laughs> so i was playing those clubs but i wasn't making a lot of money um came out Do you remember with, you, you said maybe the metro you played at played the metro played some other places uh, wrigleyville places people might remember you know cubby bear um what else was it cubby uh, bear is a cool cool joint. it is a cool place <laughs> i played call place a place called sluggers yeah which yeah. is in wrigleyville did you ever do um the dueling pianos thing at Sluggers? No, I have not. There was I a I, not. I I never played there, but I used to go see people play at Sluggers because okay. they had like two floors, right? They do. And upstairs was that where you played? It was. I a, think it was. They it, when I was going there, it was kind of set up as like a little bit of a nice kind of lounge, and they had yeah two pianos. And I think they would do like a. This is a long time ago. I can barely remember. This is when I was in college. But. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember. Um, you know what the setup was, but it was it was I think there was two rooms. It was great. Uh, Sublime, three eleven started that type of music started to come into play. So we were doing just a lot of covers and you know, those sure. type of things. <laughs> Try to throw in some of your originals. Um, I had Sublime's stu- an awesome band. I, I really like their music. I Absolutely, still, stuff really holds up. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still listen to their. I have some of their albums. I still listen to. So, uh, but after doing that, playing clubs and going through my savings pretty quickly. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and where, where were you staying at this point, too? Were you, did living you find in, family or did you? No, I had an apartment. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got a studio apartment and uh, was living there. And uh, But I was spending all the time downtown because sure. I moved to Chicago. The guys in the band that I had joined were a few years older and experienced the new Chicago. So that, you know, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, even if we weren't playing or gigging, we were down at, you know, in Wrigleyville or we were down in, in Rush Street or whatever and spending money like a drunken sailor, you know. For what I mean? sure. <laughs> so I blew through that and I realized, you know, I, I have to get a job because I got to pay rent. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, I, I got to pay bills and <laughs> I got to grow up at some point. So, sure. Yeah. So what I did was uh, I started working in as an activity director in nursing homes. Okay, sure, yeah. And started working mm-hmm. in senior living. I had no experience at all. But other than my mom was a nurse, and I would go with her uh, when I was younger to she would work in retirement communities. So I always was comfortable around seniors and loved you know, being with them and experience. And 
Sure. So I got into the senior industry, you know, and started working with that. Still gigging, still playing weekends and occasional weeknights, but I, I had to make money. You know, yeah, I right. really had to make serious <laughs> money. So I started doing that. Um, and I, I was, you and I were talking previously, I have a great story uh, <laughs> about the shop that was on right across, where it used to be across from the art museum, right? So this would be like your first time. At Maxwell's. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, let's, let's hear it. <laughs> so my dad, uh, was still traveling and he'd do some business in Chicago. By then he had gotten out of the music business. He was into, um, flashcards and working with Motorola, Motorola. And so he had some business in Chicago. So sometimes he would stop off in Chicago, do some business here, then keep heading out to Las Vegas for a convention or Los Angeles. And so I had found out about Maxwell's, Maxwell Drum Shop. And I said, oh, this is incredible. And I don't even remember if I even found it online or I just saw it in, in you know music publication or whatever. So I had called, dad came in over the weekend and I had called the shop and I just left a general voicemail. I didn't even know what the hours were. And I can't remember the name of the guy who was working for you at the time. It's but probably he, Ben. Maybe. This is probably 96, yeah, would have had to. 97. Because at that point it was either him or my dad you would have talked okay, to. Okay, <laughs> yeah. And he called up, he said, no, if you guys want to come in, I said, are you guys open on a Sunday? And he said, no, but I'll come in, I'll meet you, and I'll open the shop. Oh, nice. <laughs> and we, I was uh, just flabbergasted. I mean, how nice of a guy. So dad and I, he, dad was staying with me at the time. We drove in, and we got in, and you know, we walked around. It was just jaws hit the ground. Jaws hit the ground immediately. It was just an amazing store. And that was the one on the eighth floor in the Fine Arts Building? Yeah. Because there was a smaller one upstairs, but then right around then, yeah, it sounds like... This would have been a couple years in to, to when the shop when the shop had really gotten going in, in the fine arts building and and we had uh, we had that big long room with the window at the end. Yes, <clears throat> and the, the, these two things the the Duke Ellington and Barry yes. Deems things one of which had the Buddy Rich kit on it. And yes, then, uh, the Rufus Jones kit on the other one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there are Matter pictures of... all over the internet of that. Yeah, <laughs> the, the I, and I set. and I got a picture uh, of my dad next to the Buddy Rich set. Cool, in man. the shop, uh, you should uh, if you have that send yes. it to me, and I'll I'll put it up on the YouTube version of this. So I will. People can can scope it out. <laughs> oh, he was in heaven because yeah. he was you know he was the biggest Buddy fan and always used to see Buddy when he would come in Chicago. That's awesome, man. I'm glad I'm glad he got to see this. Oh, show. it was it was thrilled. <laughs> so it was amazing experience. It was so nice of your employee to come in and meet us, open the shop on a Sunday, and uh, and I remember my dad was talking about Frank's, you know, Frank's drum shop. And sure. he'd always tell me stories about Frank's. I never made it, <laughs> but he'd always tell me about, you know, all, all the cats would come in and everybody was everybody would go to Frank's. <laughs> and so he was talking to, I think you were saying his Ben, and he said, I remember these huge drumsticks that Frank's had. And it said Frank's on it. And he pulled out and you guys had yeah. the drum set, <laughs> you know, the drum sticks from the. We still from, got them too. Yeah, you've yeah, seen them in the other room. I did. Right? I did. One and of them has like a little bit of a burn mark from, I think, a light that it was next to or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I thought my dad was going to cry. I mean, I thought he was, he was literally tearing up, going, oh, I can't believe you guys have it. This is amazing. So, yeah. That's awesome. It was the best experience, you know, and, and obviously have followed you guys since you've progressed all the way to this store. Yeah, very cool. Very yeah. cool. That's awesome. So, so then you you do the retirement home stuff, which is really cool. You you worked with my grandma, yes, and and you do like you know, kind of like activities and it's yeah. just fun stuff for people to kind of keep their um, you know their yeah keep keep their their minds active and, and yeah you know and just yeah you play like old tunes that they know really well and I I really I think you made make a lot of people happy with what you do, which is awesome. Well, that's that's the payoff. It, it, so to make a long story short, to going from in the senior industry, and I started my own consulting company to working into senior communities and performing more and more, even though I was still gigging clubs and bars and all those type of things. And I and I realized, you know, this is great. I started working more and more with senior communities and park districts and libraries too, and all that. And I realized, you know, so, yeah, you do some stuff with kids as well. Like, I do. I do some a lot kid of group groups, stuff. group that's, that's settings. What you seem to be like really, really good at. Yeah, and I went all in. I mean, I all in performance. That's my, you know, that's my profession now. Um, and I'm glad to be making a living at doing it. But um, yeah, so uh, drum circle groups, right, which are phenomenal. Uh, 
and uh, a lot of times I'll do it for the scenic communities. I'll go in, I do a program on, say, Nat King Cole or the big bands era or Chicago dance clubs, you know, the, the, the Aragon, the Trianon, the Willowbrook Ballroom, and some of our lectures, but a lot of times as music performances. The awesome thing about it is no matter how much I'm lecturing and talking about it, performing about it, you have seniors coming up to you saying, I saw Harry James there back in 1937 and, sure. you know, <laughs> Buddy was playing or whatever. Or I saw Duke Ellington's band or I met Louis Belson or whatever. That's the awesome stories about it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's that's really fantastic. Yeah, you must have really heard some some really sweet uh, stories. Yeah, the, yeah, those old ballrooms, I, I wish I could have seen uh, – I mean, there still are people that play in those. I've seen. You ever go out and watch like trad jazz, like traditional jazz stuff? I've seen some stuff online about it. Yeah, you, you can. Um, uh, Mike Mike Al- Albaniak, he's a good friend of mine. He's he's a local musician. Yeah, um, I haven't seen him in a little while, but he if you, if you go into our jam session videos on YouTube, there's a bunch that's a trad jazz group, which means traditional jazz. Sure, it's kind of like Dixieland. But it's the Chicago version of it, you know, okay. which is different than stuff that's from like it's it's very different. It's actually it's it's interesting stuff. There's a lot of hits. There's a lot of stuff you gotta know. Yeah, and you only learn it by playing it. And it's interesting, kind of sad, I guess, because yeah, not too many people know how to do it anymore. Mm. Art some, form. Some yeah, a lot of young musicians. I think they listen to it and they just they go, "Oh, I could do that." And it's like, well, no. Like think about it. I actually, watch what he's doing. They yeah. they play really really quietly. Okay. It's almost as if there's like no amplification. Sure. They play in these big halls, and I'm talking like really quietly. Yeah. And that's actually that's one of the things that I'm, I'm impressed with on your playing. You've got a nice tasty feel, which is like thank you. Uh, you know, and I it, it's funny because I didn't know you had such a uh, like a rock background, and yeah, you I mean you w- yeah. Let, let me ask you. Sure. How did you um, how did you transfer from playing hitting so hard to, to playing more? Kind of tasty light stuff. <laughs> Two easy things. One was my dad and being raised on jazz. Right, right. Second was wanting to work. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. So do, I, do what your boss tells you. Exactly. <laughs> I learned really quickly, like when I was starting to work, you know, uh, 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 the hotels in Chicago or playing like uh, the John Hancock are going up and you're in a room and you're playing a dinner and there's people that are sitting five to seven feet from you. Right, right. You better learn how to play the brushes pretty quick. So it was it was just, you know, trial and error and learning how to play very quietly. And, there's and nothing wrong. I was watching this video the other day about this guy who was playing at a some gig. It was a YouTube video. And he was he was like, what's the point of them bringing, you know, bringing music here if it's just going to be in the background? And it's like, well, I mean, they're, it's their establishment. You know, if they want to bring you in to be in the background, then just, you know, be in the background. You want to get paid? <laughs> yeah. Want to make a living? You got to work? You got to do what's required. That it was required on the gig. And yeah, sometimes yeah. you'll be able to really. Yeah. Sometimes it's all about you. And sure. That, those are the ones that are the most fun. Sure. I'm kind of a like the I'm jams. actually a fairly loud player most of the time, but I can if I need to. I'm, I'm kind of a dynamic player. That's kind of how I describe yeah. my playing. I get I'll I'll get really loud, but then sometimes I'll be really quiet and kind mm-hmm. of do the whole thing. But yeah, back to Mike and, and the trad jazz stuff. Man, yeah. he just yeah he really stays out of the way, but then he gets those hits every time. And there are some really specific hits in this music. Sure. So if you just listen, you'd be like, oh, that's easy. Yeah, it's not so easy, actually. This, yeah. and, they, and it was cool. I went to go see them. It was someplace in, like, the southwest suburbs. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was a really big ballroom. And, you know, they had uh, banjo. And there were probably, like, probably like 200 people there. Yeah. And everyone was dancing. It was really cool. Oh, <laughs> it was really cool. fun. Yeah. I had a good time. If I ever go again, I'll, I'll invite Please you to, do. to come. I, I'm so busy nowadays. I probably... I, you can't usually, and then yeah, right now there's not a lot of big uh, big shows happening or, at all. But it'll, it'll all come back, you know. It will. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, the, the that style of music is really fun stuff. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Do do you do uh, do you, do you ever do like Artie Shaw stuff? Like do you, do you go that far back? Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of Artie Shaw. I love, yeah. Uh, oh, that clarinet stuff, man. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Benny. Just uh, fun Artie music. Shaw. Yeah, it's amazing music. That's that was the time and era where you had the greatest musicians playing the most popular music in the world. For sure, everybody was buying the albums. They were playing everywhere. They were on TV. They were in movies. Yeah, yeah, it was the, the best era. The, the like being uh, able to play really well and proficiently was an essential part of day to day life. You know, I mean, yeah, even during like the war, even during like really really hard times, it's like a morale thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and socially, the dancing, the the, the Aragons and the Trianons and the Willowbrooks and all those great places, 
dancing played such an intricate part of socialization. It, yeah. was, it was as popular as going to the movies for, for couples back in the day. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you'd pack 3,500 into the Aragon <laughs> every single night, you know, the bands are playing. That's so cool. Yeah. There, there are some little things that go on that are, like, like I know that the, um, what's the club on Thursdays on the north side, uh, the, uh, not Green Dolphin Street, that used to be. The Green Mill. Green Mill, yeah. Yeah. They, um, they, they do some cool old-fashioned stuff where people dance yeah. and they, they, like, dress up and stuff like that. I've never gone, but it seems like it would be really fun. Fitzgerald's, I think, still has a big band play there, too, as well. Cool, um, cool. They have that. I know they have big bands. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually know some of the guys that run the big bands. Mm-hmm. It, I don't think there's a lot of dancing going on, though. Probably not, knowing the <laughs> yeah, size that, of the that's place. That's more about the, yeah, the, yeah. just the kind of sit down and, and dig the dig the music. Yeah. Yeah, but that's very cool. It's, it's funny, yeah, how over the years, uh, culture just in America, it just changes so quickly. You know, like you go from one phase to another. I mean, just now in our conversations, we've gone all the way from like the <laughs> the 20s and then you know, the 40s, and then the 60s. Yeah. And then, I mean, we didn't really talk too much about the 60s, but I've, on another podcast, I've covered that extensively. And then, you know, the 80s, 80s where I guess people were kind of dancing, but it's different. It's a little bit different. And then, you you know, you go to the, why did people stop dancing to jazz? In the bebop era, they actually had signs that said no dancing allowed because they wanted people, which is, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I see what they're going for, but it's also a little... A little kind of sad. I mean, and then people still like to go out dancing, but nowadays you go to the club, and I just I'm not big on that myself. It's yeah. a DJ, and it's so loud you feel like you're you're you know you're gonna like explode <laughs> the, the, the bass. And, oh, here's the bass coming from yeah. the away. I know, and it's just yeah, it keeps getting more and more intense. Sometimes I think like, what are they gonna do next? Maybe you know, I mean, like what you know, my my kids like what what kind of clubs? What are clubs gonna be like when they? With their, uh, I wonder if they'll even have clubs anymore. Yeah, yeah who, who yeah, knows? knows? I mean, probably do stuff in, on their computer. Yeah, they'll, right? we'll have like a holodeck. I don't know if you ever watched Star Trek, but yeah, like we'll have a holodeck where you just go in there and it's an artificial environment. Yeah, <laughs> maybe the Jetsons had it right all those years, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Everything keeps chugging along, though. You know, changes happen, and and yeah, you got to be creative to figure out a way to you do to stay. You know, to relevant. stay relevant. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> stay relevant, stay working, and and constantly. You guys provide a great opportunity with the jams here, which are awesome. Yeah, for sure. You played a bunch of those. I played <laughs> a bunch of them. Fun. Always have a good time. You get to meet other musicians. How's um? Uh, who's that bass player that you always used to play with? Uh, uh, Tim Hayes. Tim. Yeah, yeah. I remember. It's got the same name as you. Yeah. Is he Tim's doing great. Good? Yeah, he's doing good. Awesome. I yeah. miss him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel in every once in a while for his uh, his band and when they need it if their drummer can't make it their first call guy um so I'll, sure. anytime i have a chance to play with tim he's a great musician great guy very knowledgeable tons of experience so i just love yeah, some cool vocal stuff play great bass, vocals yeah, yeah. So that's a great two things to cover i mean stand up bass he'll always have work i think yeah, yeah. stand up <laughs> bass players it's great to play stand up yeah <laughs> for sure so yeah. but yeah and then um yeah, I mean, you've talked about some of your influences, but why not just touch on maybe, like, who are some, uh, I mean, I guess they don't have to be jazz drummers. We sure. focus a lot on jazz stuff. But, yeah, just maybe name, like, five or six drummers that have really influenced you over the years. Maybe people that are a little less known, if you can, just because, sure. you know. But, but yeah, whoever whoever's really, you know, Well, uh, you. going back, I mean, obviously I was raised on, uh, obviously Buddy played the biggest role. Uh, my dad was the biggest fan, and, and those guys, uh, Ed Shaughnessy and, and Gene and, and Louie. Um, f- then getting into the small group, um, Joe Morello, his ride alone was, was mind-blowing. I definitely went through the fusion years of Tony Williams and all those great drummers too. Um, the guy that I continue to go back to all the time for uh, repertoire, playing all styles of music, and being so versatile is Steve Gadd. Just you know, Steve, Steve Gadd. Just, yeah, cool. I think that's the first time we've talked about him on the podcast. Yeah, actually. Steve is my, you know, outside of Buddy is my biggest influence. And um, do you play in any rock groups now? Uh, I play rock, yeah, gigs. I'll play rock gigs. Let I'm not know in any if you're bands. Ever playing a gig, I'd love to come check you out. Sure, <laughs> if the gig calls for it, I mean, I'll play whatever's needed. Sure. <laughs> um, Al Foster, love Al Foster. Um, amazing drummer. You know, um, guys who are versatile, guys who play different styles, um, guys that can sit in and play authentic 
jazz, authentic blues, authentic country music. Those are the guys that inspire me. And going back and it's just kind of going back and listening to stuff like uh, Hank Williams, uh, going back and listening to uh, Muddy Waters, BB King, those drummers, those guys that played in that style in that era. Those are the guys that I love. I, that's what I've been doing. Spending a lot of time going back and listening to guys that have played that style of music and on the road, sure. you know, for for years. Those are the guys that are you know blown my mind for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Steve Smith, yeah, he's. I like his uh, his swing feel a lot. Yeah, a lot of this. It, it, there are less and less people who can really do like a legit nice like swing feel, and he's yeah. he's got a cool one. I, I like his. I think he really he plays a lot of that old school '30s and '40s stuff really authentically. Yeah, <laughs> the rudiments he chooses and the, the the rudiments. He doesn't hit the toms a ton. You know, you use them as accents. That's one thing old school sure. drummers did that uh, was so different. And like lead, a lot of the old school drummers would lead the phrase with snare drum, whereas nowadays almost all like every feet. video I see on YouTube, every single phrase starts with a double kick on the bass drum. Feet. Yep. Like every single one. It's it's okay to do that sometimes, but to me it gets a little bit. Um, I don't know. It's like it's because it's the biggest drum you have. Yeah. And if you use it like all the time. Yeah. To me, it just becomes, it's like, it's almost like obnoxious sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> well, it starts to sound the same, doesn't it? And yeah, then the yeah. music starts to be written around that as well. Yeah. And then you fall into that loophole. It's almost like the, the bottom has become the top, and the top is, is yeah. you know, really uh, almost playing like what the bass, the bass drum used to be playing, you know. But uh, so I was real definitely... eloquent about the, the usage of the bass drum minimally. And that, oh. that comes from, you know, pre-amplification, I think. Amazing to go in and hear Papa Joe Jones. I go back and I'll still watch video of him, and he's playing with brushes. Yeah, behind the big band, and he still sounds like a like a freight train coming in. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, that's the amazing thing about Papa. He, I always but, say yeah, he's probably my my favorite drummer just to watch. I mean, he, he's such a great performer. <laughs> liquid, yeah, <laughs> pure liquid, and how he how he played and, and phrased. So, uh, a lot of those guys, uh, Steve Smith, uh, Steve Gadd. Uh, I know you're saying not you know necessarily big name guys, but uh, my dad, 1988, 89, took me to go see the Chick Corea trio, and that's when I was exposed to Dave Weckl. Yeah, and that was uh, you know <laughs> just blew my mind on that too. That was a whole another world getting into. And then uh, I got to go see. He also took me to go see uh, Dennis Chambers. Nice. I got to see Dennis play, and and got to meet Dennis and. You know that was a mind blower too as well. So yeah, yeah, man, all all really good uh, good names. Yeah, if you're a great drummer, I mean, I dig you. You know, I love to <laughs> listen to listen to a lot of different guys, but I I, I tend to f- go back to the different eras or different styles of music and listen to the guys play. You know, very authentic blues or country or or, or you know whatever the style is. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And then what about so what what kit are you playing on now? So I use, depending on the gig, uh, I have uh, a sonar. I think it's the Martini set, which is, it's hysterical. I think it's a 14. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a 14 bass drum. Uh, I play that. So I play at the Gale Street Inn, uh, uh, the restaurant in the north side, uh, usually on Monday nights. And I've had some drummers come up to me, and and it's hysterical. Some of the guys are familiar with the kit. Some of the guys will come in and just laugh and go, what what is that? You know what what's so the size tiny. of it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so that it, but it works. I love that kit. I play it obviously wide open and it, it it's perfect. Yeah, they're good solid drums. They are. Uh, I have a Mapex uh, with an eighteen. I think I might have seen you play that one once. Yeah. Yep. Maybe I can't remember that. It was this was probably two three years ago now when I saw yes. it because my yeah my grandma was staying at the place and you were doing. Just kind of jazz standards, yeah. which was it was really nice. Yeah, I think the people just loved it, and uh, yeah, she was never, she, she well, she was never huge into jazz music, but I still think she she had a good time. She was into um, kind of almost like R and B singer stuff. Okay, kinda like I can't even remember. It, it was kind of it was kind of smooth, like with uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't well, kind of what standard what AM used to be. What AM radio would be on? You mean that type of stuff? Maybe, yeah. I can't remember like the station she used to listen to, but she would always have the same one on. I remember, yeah. and and uh, you know, it was yeah, you know, it was all right. <laughs> My <laughs> she, mom she would be the it. same thing. My mom would have a radio on in the kitchen, and she'd be you know cooking or doing whatever she's doing, and it was great because AM radio you would have you'd listen to either Anita Baker 
or Ann Murray, or you'd have Hall and Oates on it, or Sonny and Cher, or whatever, you know, yeah. growing up as a kid. So, um, but uh, yeah, so Mapex sonar, and I have a, a D drum uh, kit with an 18. That's a Mother Pearl. Uh, I use that um, that set, and I have way up in storage. I have a, a Tama set too. That's a 22. I don't usually get that baby out too much because it's a it's a big bass drum and I don't usually it's use for those. The, the rock gigs. <laughs> yeah, if I'm playing an outdoor festival or something a little loud sure. or whatever. But but the way the engineering is done now, as you know, and and I, I can go in and do an outdoor. Um, I played the Ice of the Sky Festival last summer with a D drum set in eighteen and <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. What about what like what's your favorite snare drum? Um. Gretsch. Um, oh, Gretsch. Yeah, I love. I have some Gretsch sets, uh, Gretsch snares that I use. Um, yeah, I rotate different ones. Is like a metal a, one or a wood one? or just uh, It's a metal one. Oh, cool, man. Yeah, it's a metal one. I love that. That's my go-to. I use that usually most gigs. Yeah, their snares are kind of punchy, those die-cast hoops. Yep. You know, it gives you a nice... And, and they're really easy to dial down a little bit to not be too... I played a gig a little while ago that, man, it was like the livest room ever, and... I even use I use muffling on the drums, and I even I muffled the cymbal a little bit just because it was so live, you know. Did it really? Everything was. But it worked. It's it's almost like the wallet trick. Just put your wallet on your snare drum, you there know you go. that kind of thing. Get a Costanza wallet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because and then it. You don't have to, but it just makes it so that when you're playing, um, it because to play like really quiet, really fast for a really long time is incredibly taxing. Um, but if you put that on there, you can just relax a little bit when you're yeah. playing. You know what I mean? That's how it feels for me. <laughs> sure. You can, you yeah, can the, still lay in a little bit. and Right. That's yeah. why they used to have tone controls in all the drums, you know? Yeah. Playing in those big, boomy places and with, yeah. with less amplification, if sometimes none, you know? Sure. I have a, I have a Mapex, too. Uh, that's a hand-hammered. Um, um, uh, and it, it, it's... It, it's a real sensitive snare, but the brushes cut through on it because I usually use brushes on this particular gig. They use, uh, but it's great. And if you go to sticks, you can you can kind of lay into it a little bit, and it's still not going to be too pronounced and too bright and too loud. And right. you know, some some of the club owners, some of the restaurant owners, as soon as they see sticks come out, yeah, <laughs> they're, you know, you start literally see them sweating and you know starting to shake. So <laughs> for sure, <laughs> oh no, a stick. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean, man. Yeah. Oh geez, everyone's gonna leave. Yeah, yeah. I've, exactly. I've, I've I've played at bars before where it was just some band, and it was kind of like a, a rock band where like you start playing and like five people leave like right away. You know, it's like oh geez, they, man, maybe we should turn it down a little bit. You know, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. yeah. depending, you know, there's just so many different genres of music out there, and you might let's say you start with like a really aggressive blues tune and you're uh -huh. playing loud and some people might just not be into that you know so yeah. just, just all right let's go to the next place <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I've, I've played the goofiest gigs you could imagine i remember i was playing a gig and uh, it was near like boys town and, and there was um you know on uh what, what was it on halstead mm -hmm. and it was it was a little south of it but there was just like no one there, and then all of a sudden, all these guys come from from Boys Town. And they start dancing, and they were just—it was so awesome that they came by. We didn't, you know, we didn't. They just—they just were walking by, yeah. and they started dancing, and they were just like the most, uh, uh, you know, lively bunch. <laughs> one of the guys threatened to kill me if I stopped playing because he was having so much fun dancing. He so said, "If you stop playing that beat, we're, we were doing kind of like disco stuff, a lot sure. of disco groups." Sure. <laughs> Which could be fun. Yeah, they're, they're, you did, were you ever in like a disco group? That That's one thing we never really... That was kind of in there in the... Yeah, in the I mean, 80s. I played whatever. Whatever was needed for the gig. I mean, sure. I've done my <laughs> billions of weddings and, and playing that, you know, you know the pulsating sure. hi-hat, just keeping that groove going. And then... D disco, you know. a lot of it's really bad. But some of some of that stuff's actually really cool. Like oh, yeah. The, it's a... They get that like real nice funky bass line going mm -hmm. on. And, you know, oh, it's the nice bass drives it. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> hi hat and the bass drum. Uh, yeah. I mean the bass and the, and the hi hat right. driving it. But uh, yeah, if it's good, I dig it. And uh, a lot of Donna Summer for sure. Yeah, man. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else you wanted to touch on? <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Um, sure, sure. <laughs> the shop is amazing. Um, it's every time I come in. You know, besides the new sets that you have, but the vintage sets. Is amazing, and when you when I have a chance, we're just talking about like Dijonet's set right out there. Yeah, I'm sitting there. I come in. I look at. It, I go, that looks like a set that Jack would have played. And you go, yeah. Matter of fact, that was one of Jack's sets. I think it was on like so many different albums and live gigs. <laughs> oh yeah, and so that's the amazing thing. I mean, for it, everyone that that's the one. It was in New York for a while, 
it's uh, black and then it has uh, the it's like a copper hardware. Yeah, it yeah. looks like a copper. And then I and I as soon as I saw it, I thought of Jack because uh, the the black heads. Yeah, yeah, you know that he, he. I don't know if he still plays them, but I know he. I remember seeing him playing with them, and so I saw that. But and then there's a is it a Roger set back there? The Butch Miles, yeah, <laughs> uh, double bass. Um, I saw that back there too. So anytime I have a chance to come in the shop, it's awesome. And you always uh, got something cool and exciting. You do. It's new. <laughs> you do. And you always for those who go to the Chicago Drum Show. It looks like the one this year is going to be canceled, but then there's going to be a big one at the old venue next year. And Tim always helps us out. So if you want to meet Tim, um, if you come to the Chicago Drum Show, he'll probably be at our booth hanging out. Yeah. For many of you who are listening, you've probably been to the show and you've probably seen him there before. So yeah, really I love remember that show. Yeah, yeah. And then um, yeah, do, is there any, any um, like uh, social media, maybe like site, my or, website, like, Facebook? Yeah, yeah. yeah any, my website, wanna... which is uh, timwilsey.com, dot uh, com. Tim W I L S E Y dot com. Um, and uh, I, I post stuff. And I have some things on YouTube. Um, There's some of the jam session videos with you playing that I've put up before. So. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and then uh, other you know gigs that I've done. So yeah, usually the website, and then I advertise uh, a lot of times my gigs on WDCB nice. ninety point nine, which is yeah, that's my the best radio station in the world. That's my favorite radio for, station for Chicago land. That's that's the go to place for totally for jazz. <laughs> Absolutely, it's my favorite. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that and then. Uh, Phone number, if I plug it, is 630-649-2647. And uh, people will text me, hit me up, and are you available for a gig or where are you playing, those type of things. So, yeah. Hey, right on, man. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, well, yeah, pleasure pleasure talking Thanks with you. Thanks for having me. And then, uh, yeah, uh, check out our website, maxwelldrums.com. In the beginning, I say all the other things. And, yeah, everybody, thanks for listening. Y'all take care out there. <laughs> Cheers.